Me and Kate can sure talk. We've spent more than two hours together now in this hour third conversation. And I love talking to Kate. And it's like we said in the first episode, there's something in the chemistry of what it is that we do that brings out these lovely rants. So she gets a thread and just kind of does something with it. Today, part of those threads has been coming together as a nation. Uh, speaking about Canada Day that was celebrated just six days ago in Canada when we were recording this, which then led us into all sorts of weird stuff about chauvinism and toxic masculinity and femininity. And do we really like applying that label, which then led us into identity politics? Uh, and what's an identity? And when can I use that? And when can't I? And who's allowed to ask what questions? Because questions are really, really important. So dive in with us and have fun. How are you? I have just come from bed where I went to lie down for a read and a little nap. So I'm good, but public like a lovely is let me out. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go let him out. Okay. That's what he was saying. So yeah. let me out right now. Okay. Yep. That's you know. That's the way he is. Yeah. They are demanding creatures. Yes. But quite yeah. sweet. Quite sweet. Well, yes, exactly. Do you have Good. any pets? Uh, no, I don't. We I have quite a few allergies to dogs and cats and pollen and other things and, and some breeding issues. And so um, we don't. I used to have doves inside the oh, house so I had things. yeah I had two and birds can be difficult to sex if you're not uh, a bird person it's hard to tell and uh, so we didn't know but then they uh, one of them laid eggs and the eggs hatched so I thought oh okay so then so you know boy and a girl <laughs> yeah and they made uh, they made a baby and they're so lovely I would I would let them out sometimes um, in various somewhat constrained parts of the house and they would doves aren't great flyers but they love their ground feeders so they love to just walk around and I would throw seeds on the ground and they would just have the loveliest time and and I would put on um, old jazz and that was kind of their jam in my mind anyway I was sure that I would put on Billy Holiday or you know uh and any of any of the the old crooners and and they would just be so happy. Then I would put out a bath in a pie plate and they would have the loveliest time. So I loved having them and they used to wake me up with their cooing, yeah. like, like little sort of rooster coos in the morning that they would have these lovely sort of soft trilling sounds that they would make. And, and so they were really lovely, but then these breathing issues cropped up and we went through a phase of having to, uh, by process of elimination, figure out what was wrong. So it was putting all of our firewood outside. So we used to have a basement full of firewood because we have one wood stove, two wood stoves and a uh, wood burning furnace. So we have this big basement. So we thought, well, well, we'll just keep all of our wood indoors. It's so much easier in the winter. And that's apparently really terrible for air quality. So yeah. we had to get rid of all the wood and get all the ducts cleaned. And finally it came down to the doves. And uh, again, just sort of the particles in the air. And uh, so yeah. they actually went back to, they, they literally went to a happy farm. <laughs> that was not just a story that you tell a kid. 
about uh, the magical place that their pet has suddenly disappeared to, but we, we took them back to where I got them. So I, I got two doves from the farm and I brought back three. So, um, well, they got yeah. a good deal then. <laughs> oh yeah. They, I mean, for sure. Now the baby has, has his own wife and family. Oh, so, uh, yeah, sweet. because it was the whole aviary full of like, you know, 50 or 60 doves at any given time. And, and it's, it's, lovely and outdoors and so I'm sure I'm sure they're happy they live mm -hmm. a long time mm -hmm. yeah doves live to be I think like around 15 so they would definitely yeah. still be there yeah I wouldn't be able to pick them out though and this is just kind of the funny thing about most birds like that especially a bird like a dove is I felt so attached to them but in the in in the in the, in the plainest of daylight if faced with even just 10 of them I wouldn't know which ones were mine. So, <laughs> yeah, no, they were good I'm, though. Yeah, precisely because I get doves is kind of like those part of the, it's like fish. It's like, would you be able to yeah. tell one guppy from another? No. One goldfish from another? And there's really no, there's no relationship there between a human and a dove. I know some birds bond, but certainly doves, doves don't. So it's, they're more, and I don't mean to diminish their existence in this way, but they're more a relationship I have to them as, as my experience, mm -hmm. not as uh, a reciprocal kind of a thing. So, although sometimes you wonder if cats are the same way, <laughs> because cats sort of don't necessarily choose to, be in relationship with a human. They will use them for a source of warmth or lap or pets. But there isn't the same kind of bond there. You kind of feel like a lot of the time they would just go and hang with whoever is filling the food yeah. dish. Although Pop the cat know. can be quite a quite an unfaithful this one. Let's put it that, that way. Uh, yeah. But then again, yeah. I, I think I choose to look at it precisely the other way around. He's so good of at course. making relationships that he just loves hanging out at the neighbor's places. Uh, and he'd be happy to. Yeah. But but I given that, because he's he's, you know, truth be told, he's one of those cats that kind of go into everybody's home. Cause he's like, oh, I here's the home. Cat. I can join. But he does know that he lives here. Yeah. I mean, he knows that. I know that given that he spends so much time in other places and the next were one off or one over, he, they have a cat that's called um, Cuckoo. And Cuckoo has food out. Um, so Pop eats most of Cuckoo's food. And he wow. just hangs there and they're so happy. We just love him. And I'm going, oh, yeah, thank God. Um, but he does come here. He spends most, I mean, in a in a year, I would say he spends um, probably 70% of all nights he's indoors with me. So yeah. that's my, that's kind of how I know that he knows where he lives. Uh, right is, right you know, to roost as it were um, exactly yeah well we sort of expect less of cats in that way like in in it's just different it's a different personality it's a different kind of character yeah yeah i was i was actually just posting on instagram today on his account um because he's been lying here on my table um on top of my knitting Oh, of course. Sweetly helping. So, so he was yes. like, this is a study of sleeping cat on knitting. Um, and somebody, somebody wrote me and said, oh, you should teach him to knit. I've heard about cat's cradle. You could definitely, you should be able to do it. And I'm like, <laughs> mm, I've never even been able to get him on a lead or it's any tricky. of my cats on a lead. There are some cats that have, have, uh, have thumbs, that, right? Those, those cats that have those crazy feet, maybe those cats could knit. Yeah. Who knows? <laughs> I'm going, that would require more patience than I'm equipped with. Um, yeah. And part of the reason why I like cats is because they're not easy to train. 
I mean, that's kind of the the draw for me as compared to Yeah, a dog. you just have It's to like, accept what they give you. Yeah. A dog says, what can I give you? What can I give you? Yeah, What can I yeah, give you? yeah. And the And a cat cat says, says, kind of the other way around. you It's can like, wait. you know, give it Yeah, to what me. can you give me? And also, like, I'll give you a little when it suits me. You just Yeah. wait. And when I do, you drop everything. Yeah, they definitely got us wrapped for sure. I love, I do love cats, but I just, I can't. I can't live like that wheezing and and my Of face course. just dripping and No, oh it's no, it's it that makes would me a be little too sad high a though. cost. yeah I'm yeah lucky that way. yeah no But you had Canada Day over the weekend, didn't you? yeah we did Because it's yeah it was really July great 6th today when we're recording, just so people know. yeah so yeah so Canada Day is July 1st Yeah, Oh, which so marks it was confirmation. Friday. Yeah, yeah. And we have um, our little tiny outport that we live in in Nova Scotia has the most spectacular fireworks on this whole part of the province. Honestly, if not in the whole province. I don't know why. It's just the volunteer fire department that's just their thing. And someone over there is very passionate about the fireworks and really knows what they're doing. They go on for almost an hour. And... It's really spectacular. And so our house backs onto a narrow little arm of water, of ocean. And we're pretty close to the main bridge in, in, in where we are. And they shoot the fireworks off from the bridge. So we're able to just, we put everything outside, quilts and pillows and a bunch of furniture. And everyone just finds the spot to plop. And, and it's just like having a front row seat. And just as the fireworks were happening, one of the infamous fog banks started rolling in, like just a wall of fog. And so between that and the smoke in the air and the color, it was very, very, and of course we had a huge bonfire going too. So it was really a particularly evocative Canada Day. It was really fantastic. We had a great time. Because we invite all of our kids, uh, sorry, all of our friends and all of their kids. So. That's a little rare for us. Usually we experience our friends being parents on Instagram or in small flashes, but uh, it's, it's not as common for us to get everyone together and to have a span of kids from four years old to 18 years old, which, which sort of inter, if there's a while there when you're a parent that you're kind of, you get to be friends with the other parents in your kid's class because you're sort of arranging play dates and that kind of a thing. But then as you, as they get older, you, your sort of circle of friends tends to spread a little because it's less, you're less kind of married to the kids in terms of your social circle. And so it's really cool to meet everybody's kids and see them running around. And we have, um, I have four different tickle trunks. So that's the Canadian speak for costume collections. So whenever I'm out and about and I see something interesting, I, I, I never pass it up. I always buy it and um, really big on Halloween in these parts. So, of course, when you have a bunch of kids coming over, you've got sparklers and big bubbles and Caran d'Ache watercolor crayons for their face. And you put all these sort of stations out and they just find these baskets full of masks and crazy things. And so the, the evening gets a little wilder as, as the night goes on because the kids are just running everywhere with croquet mallets and and uh yeah so we just had we had so much fun it's really great it just it and it it makes us all kind of weepy when when you see everyone together and the fireworks start and everyone's cuddled under a quilt with their kids or the kids are sprawled out on the grass and i'm going around just thinking oh, i just want to grab a few pictures because i i feel like when we have nights like that i never do and just to see how thoughtful everyone is when they're watching those fireworks and thinking about, and, and obviously many people who live here are not Canadian or they are landed, uh, like they're residents. Um, a lot of them are from the UK and from Europe. Um, and um, I don't know why that is. There's a lot of Germans because Lunenburg County was settled by Germans. And, um, and just a lot of people from Scotland and England Uh, just in our in our circle and so it's just really it's really interesting 
for me to watch people celebrating a country and loving a country and thinking about what, you know, what is the notion of a nation? What's it for? What is this container's purpose? And, and in my vision, it's a container that helps us test ideas about how best to live. And sometimes that container is formed by religion in some other countries. Sometimes that container is, 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 is in the context of religion, but then becomes something else based on people living there, based on culture and, uh, and other changes. But it just, it really, it, it, it made me feel grateful and just very much um, connected to, again, we've talked about this before, connected to the past mm -hmm. and never, never ever forgetting the lessons of the past and the kind of pride that my grandparents felt in their country and, and how much they sacrificed for that flag. And it, it doesn't matter to me how fashionable it is to hate the West. Um, I just, I want to cling to my roots and never fail in my sense of perspective in terms of how far we've come and how our discourse has shifted and how our awareness has shifted, how our history has formed us and how much harder life was even just a generation or two generations ago. Um, and I never wanna lose sight of that and, and not be so arrogant that I'm no longer grateful for it. So that's kind of what was on my mind is just, I love seeing everyone happy and together. And, and I just, maybe it was me projecting, but I felt like as I was walking around through the fireworks, watching everyone watch the fireworks and thinking about what it all meant. I felt like it's just been a, it's been a rough couple of years between COVID and all of the cultural politics that we're, we're sort of grappling with. Um, I don't know if you're feeling this way in Sweden, but it just, people are, are divided in the extreme. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it's, it's distressing. And I think no matter where you are, uh, where you might land politically, although for me, that's, that's a difficult thing to say. I don't think anyone's being entirely honest if they say they are 100% in one camp or another because that's just tribalism. But um, I just feel like I'm just, I've just lost my train of thought. It just went like off Isn't into it the cool air. when that happens? And then uh, <laughs> usually it kind of poofs back in again. I know, but and it will, but yeah. I'm... Feel free to jump in is what I'm saying. Save me yeah, from that but, last but So one of the things back. that I've been... Like there's, there's many aspects in this. One of them actually is just, it warms my heart to listen to you tell this story of, of, of your observational awareness or aware observations or, you know, like, like this is part of what, I think is so important this I think maybe it is what you're voicing when you say that you're walking around and you're looking at everybody and you're kind of thinking about what it means you are finding those you are connecting to the roots you are going into the ground in a sense which is what reflection can be uh, and I think mostly is if it's if it's done like in this open way where it's like oh I'm not pondering this thing it's like you're just open to whatever it is that comes it's lovely yeah, I mean, to that hear be, that it can be very restorative to try to touch into the things that we share because and I think that's where my where my thought before it pushed away into nothing that's where it was going it's just that we've been whether we like it or not, whether we mean to or not, we've been divided up into all these camps. Yeah. And those camps have been drawn in the most crude caricature, in, in the lowest resolution 
forms of good, bad, evil, good, you know, uh, low moral, you know, moral, moral and, and immoral or amoral. Um, and, and it's, it's childish and it's, it's never, it's, it's just, honestly, I find it mortifying when people start speaking that way. Um, and I think in walking around and observing everyone, um, I wrote about this a little bit. I don't know if it'll really even mean much to, to you in Sweden, but it got me thinking about uh, the tragically hip, which is probably Canada's, at least to Canadians, the preeminent kind of best known band. And the hip, like you couldn't go to a party. If you, like I graduated university in 95, was it? Yeah, 1995. And you couldn't go to a party in university and walk in and not have the hip playing really loud. Um, it was just kind of our soundtrack. If, if you were a part of my generation of Gen X, um, they were just so intensely, beautifully Canadian. And it's hard to put your finger on exactly why. Gordon Downey was the singer and songwriter. At least I think he wrote most of the songs. He was kind of the poet and had a really distinctive voice and the stories that he told were Canadian and the way that he did it was just, it, he plucked a string deep in all of us um, that we're not very good at expressing otherwise because we're not American. We don't do that whole rah rah thing, which sometimes I think is a little to our detriment, but um, Gord Downey died how many years ago? maybe four years ago or so of a brain tumor that came on fairly quickly and he knew that he was dying and they did one last tour and the very last show that they played was in Kingston, Ontario, which is where they were from, where they are from. <clears throat> and they performed this show and they live streamed it all across Canada so that everyone across Canada could watch. And so everyone was not only watching for themselves, which you could, but they were going to clubs and stadiums and open air venues to watch together on the big screen and dancing and singing along. And there's, I'm gonna get like weepy if I even talk about it, but there's, there are video clips of, I think there's a video clip of a song that they do called Ahead by a Century, showing everyone across the country in Nova Scotia and Manitoba and BC up north of all of these people singing in unison to Gora Downey as he said goodbye. Mm -hmm. And and how much, and of course, everyone singing wrong, I think if my memory serves, was part of my generation, was probably you know in their 30s or, or above. Um, and I was thinking as I was walking around on Canada Day and remembering seeing the Tragically Hit perform at uh, Thunder, is it? Um, Thunderbird Stadium, Thunderbird Stadium. I'm so gonna be so embarrassed if I get that wrong. Uh, at, at the stadium at UBC in Vancouver, Thunderbird. I'm like, my wires are getting crossed. I think it might be that. At the big stadium at UBC uh, out west. And somebody put me up on his shoulders and just a friend of mine. And just, it was just, it was one of my most vivid memories is seeing the hit play live in this massive outdoor stadium. It was so incredible. and. And they're just intrinsic to who we are as Canadians. They're a part of our national soundtrack in a way that is really universal. And I was, you know, after these last couple of years, everyone is so divided. Everyone is just intent on ripping on Canadian history and ripping on what this country stands for and, and arguing amongst ourselves and calling each other terrible names. And, and, and then of course the vaccine and the freedom and the free speech or lack of it or, and, and just everyone is just in an absolute froth. And we, we enter into Canada Day and I'm walking around just thinking about Gord Downey. And of course I had a playlist going and Ahead by a Century was on. And I thought, you know, I feel like when Gord Downey died, that was the last time we were all in unison. And nobody gave a shit what your politics were. Who cares? Because we all share this. We share this fabric. And it doesn't matter what you think of oil fields or what you think of 
whatever the latest cultural hysteria is from, you know, that's been exported from the States or, and, and right there, I mean, I'm being dismissive. So, because I'm so exhausted, I'm, I'm a part of the exhausted majority. So I'm saying it in a dismissive way because I think it has served nobody, even the people it intended to serve. Um, and that frustrates me. But the point is that was our last time being in unison. And it made me sad, but I guess I'm hoping that, that if we insist on continuing to share that fabric together and not try to rip it apart, and if we do so in a way that's kind of punk, like, you know what, I'm celebrating Canada Day, I'm celebrating the flag, and I'm, I, I, I'm, just, I'm just gonna not make a thing of it. I'm not gonna care if people that come to my party think in lockstep to the same way that I think, because I know they don't. Um, some of them might, we might intersect in, in a few ways in different pieces, but I don't care, they're my friends. I don't need, I'm not so insecure that I need my friends to echo and mirror me. I don't require that. And so, uh, yeah, that was what I was thinking on Canada Day. I was just thinking about Gord Downey and thinking about trying to stay focused on that fabric and what we share. So I don't know, I, that's kind of a long meandering, again, with, you bring out all these rants in me. <laughs> you do that, but, um, so I don't know if you're seeing the same thing in Europe. Um, it's a bit different. We have some different things to contend with, um, I think, in terms of what's on our current, uh, what's driving our state of mind um, and different histories, of course, but, yeah, what's, I mean, what's it like where you are in, in that respect in terms of sort of friendship and divisiveness and how to navigate community when it seems that the culture wants to do nothing more than to expel people from it? Yeah. Even, even when they don't want to be, when they want to still be a part of everything. And, and But all we are doing is focused on who to cast out and as quickly yeah. as possible. And yeah. it's just, and it's a hypocrisy. It's a, it's a ridiculous hypocrisy. There's a part of what you're speaking about is most definitely like alive here, very much so. Mm -hmm. um, and at the same time, I don't see Sweden or Swedes coming together. You know, we had our Sweden Day. Uh, our national day is on June 6th. But that day has never been the day. It's only, I don't know, within the last 10 years or something that that day has actually been a holiday. Mm -hmm. um, before that, it wasn't. So it's never really been a day that we have, as a nation, celebrated much. And there really isn't that type of day in Sweden or that type of, you know. Are there it, other sort of traditions? There may be attached to things. There like, are you know. other traditions, but that would be, but it's, I'm, I'm kind of struggling to see that we have one that is national in the sense that you come together because that there's, you know, we just had Midsummer and Swedes celebrate Midsummer. For right, sure. right, right. But yeah. it's a very, that's, it isn't about Sweden or the flag or nationality or it's like, and it's a very, I think, um, personal, private, or, you know, it's the family or we do this with our friends or something. So it's, it, it has a different yeah. quality to it, at least in my um, mind, but we have election day coming up in September. It's, it's, coming up on four years with the current government and then it's election year. Yeah. And it is fascinating because one, I don't, I don't watch TV news. I don't listen to radio news. I don't have a newspaper anymore. I don't go searching yeah. the news sites, etc. cetera. Oh, me neither. So I'm quite like, distant from it and I'm kind of surprised 
that I'm not getting more of it in my feeds because it's not as if I'm not online. I am online a lot. I just don't go to the local newspaper sites or, you know, the, the Swedish state television site, etc. But there's a lack of... I would say that there's kind of, there's fear in the air somehow. There's this sense mm. that we, and I don't think this is Sweden, I think this is more global than, than anything else. We've yeah. lost the ability to talk, to listen, yes. to have sticky yeah. conversations, to be in relationship with someone who thinks the other thing that I don't and that I might highly disapprove of, but can we not be friends because of that? You know, know. I'm sure there are aspects that I would say, no, I can't be friends with you, where there are aspects where I say, I'm not interested in being friends with you, but differences are interesting you know conflict is is life affirming because it it you know it shakes things up and it makes me go either i get more convinced in what it is that i believe or you can <laughs> rattle me and i can start to shake in my belief and start to say maybe i've been wrong maybe maybe i've changed my mind and yeah. if I'm never exposed to that, if I'm always outside of sticky conversations, it's like it 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 gets stale. Oh, absolutely, it does. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think I think we see the same thing happening in 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 our cultural landscape. No matter what country you're in, as long as you're in the in this fuzzy concept of the West. I mean. Yeah. It's the same in the States, it's the same in Canada that we all sort of dread the election year because I don't know that it's necessarily as bad as it is in the States in terms of just the relentlessness of the, the, the melodrama surrounding it. Um, but it, it's, it is tough to avoid for sure. And so kudos to you for, you've obviously trained the algorithms to not bother you with it which is which is a good thing yeah I, I don't I don't watch the news anymore either I have um, I mean much like the conversations that you and I are engaged in I much prefer to get information from long form and and I just I, I get to a point where I mean I think we've, we've come so far that it's not just now that people would say I have listened to what you have to say and so now, you are a blank because of what you you've just said. You are a bigot. You are a ignorant. racist. You're a, you yeah. are an ist of some kind. Yeah, yeah. You're a socialist. You're the wrong or kind or of it. Liberal. Or something. Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. And so um, it's it's gone so far that it's not just that, although that happens. It's come to the point where because you have asked that question because you are not doing and performing what everyone else is performing with these particular hashtags, or you have not joined in on this particular outrage, you are now suspect. Yeah. And you, and I've actually had people say to me, how can you not understand that you can't ask that question? Mm. You're not to do that. And, and it's the simplest question. It's, it's often just, but why? Um, you know, tell me, explain to me exactly why. And and people can get extremely agitated when you probe, when you just say, you know, when, when you're just not automatically in lockstep with whatever's fashionable. And so it's, uh, that is, it's, so it's not just the demonizing of the wrong answer. It's the demonizing of the wrong question. Mm -hmm. And that's a dire state indeed. But I think the only thing we can do in answer to that is to keep asking questions yeah. calmly and to not be bullied into not asking questions. Because I think it's too important 
to retain our curiosity. And, and I've been this way ever since I was a kid, that if there was something that everyone else was doing, my back would go up because I would think, oh, I want to be doing what everyone else is doing because how boring is that? It's, it's a real failure of imagination to be wearing the same stuff and to be doing all the same things that everyone else is doing. As I felt like as soon as everyone else was, was, was catching on to a particular thing, I would ditch it. You so would move like, oh, on. Yeah. I, I don't want to, like, I like the band, but not their fans. You know, like this is this is this this phenomenon that that happens in my mind. I'm like, there's nothing wrong with that thing that everyone's doing, but because everyone's doing it or thinking it or echoing it or parroting it, I just want to hold back now. Mm-hmm. I just want to step back and just quietly do my own exploration. Um, and so when you when you layer in that personality trait. Uh, into the whole sort of cultural and political arena. Um, there's just, yeah, it's, it's, it gets very thorny, but at the same time, I refuse, I will not be told that it's not okay yes. to ask questions or that it's not okay to find something funny and, that was funny and, five minutes ago. So. And I would, I would say that it is imperative that we keep on asking the questions. It is oh, yeah. crucial. It is our life depends on it. And the questions are in many, many ways more important than finding the right answer with, with bunny ears because right, right. it is the questioning. It is the opening up of that the kind of, you know, it's a, it's a sowing of seeds in a sense, because there can pop a lot of different thoughts and ideas and possible answers. And one or two of those might just become something really really important. But if you don't even ask the question, you know, it's like, it's, it's like we're inbreeding uh, because the answers won't be robust. They won't be viable. Mm. That's that's my feeling is like if we don't ask questions or only the right question, whatever answer we're getting is a propped up, not really viable in the real world type of answer. And we will perish. Um, but I had the same experience in my in 2013, me and a couple of others started this uh, the school movement, the school spring movement that I don't know if I've talked to you about. We called it Skulvåren. And we were asking why school? Um, as one of these questions to open people up wherever you are. If you're a teacher, well, ask it from your p- profession. If you're, if you're a um, you know, taxi driver, we'll ask it from your perspective. Are you a parent? Are you a principal? Are you a politician? Do you own a newspaper? Are you a farmer? Ask it, you know, or are you an aunt or a grandparent or, you know, it's a relative, it's, it's an important question to ask. One that yeah. I would say that we haven't asked properly for almost 150 years. Um, yeah. 100, yeah, 150, 160 years. In the 1850s, Sweden really did ask that question and set up the school system that we have today or the basis of the school system we have today. Since then, right. there's only been minor shifts to it. There's not been this, okay, let's bring it home. What's the answer today? Or what are the answers? But one one, uh, teacher said, you can't ask that question. Mm -hmm. Why can't I ask that question? (laughs) She said, because school Uh. is inevitable. And my, you know, is like, no. School is not inevitable. School is a construct. Yeah. We have made up school. There has been humans on the face of the earth for millions of years, or at least hundreds of thousands of years without school. You know, it's like, I mean, no. 
you can't ask that question because you are not of her elite status. Exactly. She went to university to study school. Yeah. So you are not qualified. You yeah, do not have exactly. the lived experience to be able to comment. So you need to sit down yeah. Yeah. and consume and shut up yeah. and take the training that we are bestowing upon you. Yeah. And that is happening everywhere where yeah. we now have this thing where only the academic, you know, academic elites are sort of able to tell us all the stupid, ignorant masses um, what's correct, what's yeah, right and it's a, it's a type of identity from... politics where of course it is, yeah. Where it's like yeah. I can't ask that question because I'm not a teacher. Like I yeah. can definitely ask that question, and my response to it is: school is most definitely not inevitable. Learning, however isn't yeah we learn that's what we do we wouldn't be what we are if we didn't learn so that but yeah. that's something completely different than school yeah that could be any number of things i mean that can be apprenticeships which is something that we've really lost yeah, and it can just be living yeah you know we yeah. how what's the main form of learning it is observing and and copying what others do around us this is what kids do this is why they you know mess about with pots and pans in the kitchens because they see someone messing about with pots and pans and they want some pots and pans for themselves to figure it out um, yeah so but one of the other things that was also very very um a common experience during the three, four years that this movement was really, really active. Um, and that was guilt by association. So just what you're saying about you even asking the question or you even not condemning something <laughs> that means yeah. that you are guilty of the same thing. Which makes me go, oh man, this is Ugh. equally dangerous territory. It's so embarrassing. We don't want to go it there. Just makes me, it's so cringe. It just, I, my problem now is being in the world and having to mask my contempt, my, my laughter when, when I encounter people like that. And I, I just, the people <laughs> that are just so asleep and, and part of the thing that is so unintentional that's such unintentional comedy when you when you encounter when you have these interactions is that these are always the people who think that they are fighting for the little guy against the man but i'm looking at them and like no no, no. you're the man yes like, you are the establishment when the banks and the elevator music and the crosswalks are painted with the tokens of your ideology yeah. You are the establishment. You have yeah. control of everything, the culture, the government, the media, every, like you are echoing what all the corporations are echoing and the corporations are echoing you. There is nothing punk about what you're saying or doing right now. You are simply pressing your thumb down often on people who make a lot less money than you do because we, we love any reason to hate the working class. Because, you know, for being unfashionable, for not for getting their backs up, for not, you know, for listening to their intuition and their common sense and not, and for asking the wrong questions. These people always think that they're just bravely, stunningly breaking new ground. And, and I just, it just, it makes me sometimes burst into laughter like a sneeze. Like, you've got to be kidding me. How can you not see what yeah. you represent and 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 the only thing that i could think of is that you know i've sending my kids to school and having them come back as as young as when they were in grade five or grade six and they would come home and go you wouldn't believe what the teacher said today and i'd be like hit me give it to me <laughs> yeah and, and we would just laugh together because kids now are growing up literally with the man in their classroom telling them that they are oppressors or that they're victims or that and it's it's nothing more than religious incantations it is like a like a like just teaching the kids to just be obedient agents yeah. of what they're what they're being sold as some kind of revolution but it's ultimately control corporatization consumerism which is keeping the people. answer to why school 
And it is still right, the right. answer to why school. That is why the school <sighs> systems that we see yeah. popped up in uh, 100, 150, 180 years ago is that. And it's still that. So just asking yes, the course. question, yeah. who's benefiting from us making kids into parrots and just parroting whatever that we feed them? Who's benefiting? And you go yeah. kind of, ugh, ugh. <laughs> yeah, I know it's really slimy to think about because I think of that, I think, I think about that when I, when I see the corporations invoking religion as well and, and making those incantations and, and pushing these narratives on us constantly wherever we go or in media. And it's, I don't know how we walk it back other than to laugh and other than to know and to have faith that our kids are growing up getting this drilled into their heads just as much as in the 80s Kids were in high school being told that, you know, uh, ZZ Top was the devil's music or whatever else it was that that they had to. Um, that the rock and roll was 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 going to make them turn violent or something like that, or that Michael Jackson's thriller video was going to turn them into demons or something. I don't know. It's the same. I mean, then the establishment wasn't saying that, but religion's worse saying that, I suppose you could say. Yeah. But kids are going to grow up naturally pushing against the establishment. Mm -hmm. And this is what the, the big mistake that the establishment has not yet understood is that you are just showing more and more of your ridiculous underbelly to these kids. And they're already laughing at you mm -hmm. because they know a power center when they see it. And it's you, they're looking up at you. They're looking at what's on the billboards. They're looking at what they see in the media. And what they see on, on internet ads, what they see on TikTok, and they're just like, mm, here we go yeah. again, like, which is refreshing to me. And I yeah. think I have a lot of faith as long as they can get through the vulnerable part of growing up without taking on the indoctrination of a lot of these narratives that mm -hmm. started out with good intentions, but that have now sort of morphed into this clown car of really, really toxic sludge which and i would love to you see more of our kids kind of just bypass around it and grow up yeah. healthy and, yeah. and shake off all of this victim oppressor mindset and shake off honestly progressivism is pushing in a direction that's regressive yeah it's reinforcing stereotypes it's reinforcing racism it's reinforcing all of the stuff that we that feminism was trying to shake off or that, that, that the human rights uh, campaigns of the past were trying to shake off. And we don't want to go back. I don't want to go back there. Nope. You know, I like to wear shit kicker boots and old man coveralls. And I like to wear a pretty dress. So I, I will not have you telling me that I am traumatized because I am one thing or another thing, or that I am um, sort of exotically wise because I am female versus male or or that I don't lie that I should always be believed no I don't need to be treated special because of my immutable characteristics or how I was born or where I was born and I also don't need to be treated uh in any way that is uh, automatically demonized for any of those things I thought we were past all that so, and we're not you know so I was mm -hmm. I, I just remembered last time we stopped at femininity and masculinity and yeah me and Dominic were in the sauna uh, at Calis in Malmö on Monday and on Monday the first Monday of the month it is queer day which means you can go wherever you can be a lady in the men's side and the man in the lady's side and whatever this, wait, they is this everywhere. The, first, the first of every month the first Monday of every month, it is queer day at this place. So we go there on the first Monday because then we can be together and be in the sun and go in the, in the ocean and whatnot. And okay. 
Because usually it's, it's it's divided by sex. It's, it's normally divided. It's the men's side and it's the women's yeah. side. And in the middle, there's a steam sauna that is mixed. And there's since a couple of years, there's a white line in the middle dividing this shared steam sauna so that men are to sit on the one side and women on the other side. But on queer so, so, day, there are so no men clear. and women. Yeah. Right? yeah. Just There's so that I'm clear, it's because you guys are when you when you have your sauna tradition, you everyone's naked. Everyone's naked. Yes, that's no, that's no what swim I, okay, so that's a distinction allowed. thing. Yeah, yeah. So not right. not allowed. It's like you yeah. can't yeah. wear a swimsuit. Um, yeah, I've heard. Yeah, yeah. So we're there on Monday, really enjoying it. Our last sauna, we say steam. Yeah. So we go into the steam sauna and we sit down. And it's not full by any means. I am the only woman in there. There's maybe six, seven men as well. In comes three ladies from the woman's side saying, ah, you should move on the other side of the white line. You know, dismissively waving at one of the men who's sitting on, on the women's side yeah, but it's queer day. There are no women in men's side. That day, that white line does not exist. It doesn't exist. You can be wherever you want to be. And we were talking about it later because it's what she did. That's chauvinism. It's like she's she was dismissive in such a way. It wasn't could you make room so that we three friends can sit together? Everybody mm -hmm. would have, you know, scuttled over and made sure that they can sit together. But she was mm -hmm. so dismissive. And it it got a or got me, it got us thinking about this difference. But it's uh, it's okay, and it's even a good thing today to speak about toxic masculinity. That is, you know, a topic of the day. It's on everybody's yeah. lips. But we oh, yeah. don't speak about toxic femininity. Yeah. We cannot. No, never. Oh, no, must not, because we can't question. You know, it's like, that is, no, yeah. that's not a thing. It's like, yeah, heck it is. It sure mm. is a thing. Because it is as much yeah. of a thing as toxic masculinity. It exists. It's there. It is. Oh, yeah. It is a reality. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, th there's a lot in there that, that I think, there are, there are layers of, of different um, uh, patterns and sort of cultural zeitgeist that are that are threaded together in in this little um, scenario that you've that you've outlined. And I think you know, it only just leaves me with more questions. Like, did those women know that it was queer day, or or did it catch them off guard? That could have been the case. And and I can see one of them came in. There was a fourth one and she came in from the men's side. So they knew. So they knew. Yeah. Huh. Well, I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, there's there's been, there's no question. See, to me, I guess I feel like there, there's so many mixed messages. So feminism would tell us that women are oppressed by men men commit, you know, 99% of the rape, 98% of the murder. So we are vulnerable and, and sex is a real thing that changes yeah. our bodies and makes us, yeah. we're not as strong as men are. We just aren't. And so um, there's that reality. And there's also the kind of believe all women sort of me too thing. And there's also um, this, this, this priority on women being empowered and having agency but then at the same time, there's also, but when it, when it serves the cultural moment, regardless of your comfort level, we're just gonna say today that there's no such thing as sex. And you have to be comfortable with that because I wouldn't wanna sit next to a naked guy that I don't know. I'm not a part of the sauna culture. So that might no. be different for me. No. I'm, 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 that's more the, the difference between you and me than, than anything that's prissy or not prissy. It's, it's just, I'm, I'm, I'm not in a, a sort of um, a, 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 a culture to the, the sort of um, 
public shared space nudist thing. Which would have so, you not going there. Which would have me not going there. Yeah, for sure. But but it would also, I mean, it's, yeah. So anyway, the point is we say on one side, the whole thing of women's autonomy, women's agency, safety, and security and ability to um, speak up and comfort and me too and all of that stuff and be believed and listen to women. But then on the other hand, we have women's discomfort doesn't matter. Um, women need to shut up when we want them to shut up, when they're not saying what we want them to say. Um, women need to go along with all of, all of these ideas around what it is or isn't to be a woman and they don't get a say. Um, you just take it. Um, and so I'm like, you got to pick one. You got to either let women have agency and disagree with you and have a bit of a bitchy moment where they might be like, yeah, don't want to sit next to a naked guy. I don't know. Or you've got to tell them that, no, the establishment gets to tell you what a woman is or what gender is or what sex is or why it should or shouldn't matter to you. Um, I would just say, why was she there on that day? I mean, I, it clearly... The, the whole point of the day was to say that everyone's just going to be intermingling and that if you're not comfortable with that, then go on Tuesday instead. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, there's just always going to be, there's always going to be people who are eh, wanting to do this in public about one and, rule or another rule. And but, but I would it's say, just I can, interesting. Yeah. I can bring it back to the sticky conversations again. Yeah. Cause it's, mm -hmm. I think the, the, what makes a sticky conversation possible and and respectful and perhaps even enjoyable in all its stickiness is yeah if I'm open and honest and, and kind of going in with what I'm experiencing. So again, mm -hmm. if if this woman had come in here saying, oh, you know, yeah exactly right owning this thing rather than and and i'm not saying that it's it's she shouldn't have done what she did she did what she did but this is what makes us not able to have the sticky conversations if she'd yeah. gone in and said oh you know this i i wasn't expecting this or whatever or could we just all sit together, my friends and I? Would you mind? Could my friends and I all sit something? together? Yeah, totally. Right? Totally. So again, what you're saying matters. How you're saying matters. In the the it is quite interested in this sauna culture at that place, because I can tell you the level of toxicity in the women's side is way higher than it is on the men's side. Oh, I have no doubt. It's way exactly, we do. exactly, right? <laughs> And yeah. I'm yeah. I'm reading Rage Becomes Her by Soraya yes, Shimali. Yes, I think you mentioned that one before. Yeah, yeah. And I've still not come more than thirty-seven pages in it. But one of the things that she speaks to is how men and anger is expected, even desired. It's you know, boys will be boys all of this thing hmm. we're allowed to be physical and rowdy etc aggression yeah aggression yeah. that comes from yeah. that women aren't so one of the things that she proposes is that as a result mm -hmm. girls women turn this repressed aggression into this toxicity amongst ourselves that being one of the reasons that's one of the outlets we can have you can have girl gangs ganging up on another one and and just totally and i went huh what an interesting yeah. hypothesis because it's like that kind of makes sense because Oh, yeah. If boys yeah. are boys then girls are girls and i'm wondering how much of that is boys and girls and DNA and how much of that is yeah. culture how much of that is because we have a culture where this is expected or desired or yeah. okay this is expected and desired and okay for the two um I think it's a little bit of both but I mean we see the same thing in the animal kingdom 
that that males uh, manifest their uh, insecurities through aggression because they have that physicality. They have testosterone and that causes uh, the aggression to be the primary mode of, 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 of expression when they are protecting, when they are lashing out, um, when they are um, looking to expand their territory or take on a mate or fight for a mate. The physical realm is their realm. Um, and I don't, you know, I don't know that there's necessarily an animal parallel that's quite that clear for animals because we don't get to know what they're thinking and speaking. Um, but we know in terms of humans that women tend to enforce conformity because we are the, 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 com the community co cohesion captains. That's what we do is we want to kind of keep people together, bring people together, unify into groups. Um, and so women um, police each other by bullying yeah. um, in a way that, that isn't necessarily physical, but that does no less damage, if not more. We have so much power over each other and over men um, that has been entirely discounted. But Which we is do one it. of the we reasons it. why it's, it's Very... kind of silly not to speak about toxic femininity as, oh, of course. as, as like the counter player to toxic masculinity. Because of course, yeah. right? We yeah. are human. There will be the light side and the dark side. The shadows are there. It will become manifest. Um, question is how yeah. and what am I doing with it and how aware am I and am I kind of taking on the the persona of sorts of me mm -hmm. being like the the teacher who said you can't question schools because it's inevitable if I kind of go about in the world in this way where I am oozing toxic femininity, but you can't question that because I'm a woman and hence you can't do that because then you're and a so bigot. It's empowered, yeah. Or exactly. misogynistic or whatever it is, right? So it's like, yeah. Mm, yeah. Yeah, I, I feel like it's, I, I, I'm, I'm even tired of the terms toxic masculinity or femininity because ultimately what it is, is it's human beings inflicting various different personality disorders upon the people around them. Yes. Yes. And it manifests differently for men as it does for women. Women have their cluster Bs that they tend towards histrionics, narcissism, borderline, and men have their particular avenues of different personality disorders that they tend to slip into. And I think it's like, let's let's be more specific instead of just saying toxic, because now, like all the other words, hate, violence, all of these words have been sort of, um, have had the rug pulled out from underneath them and, and now mean something else. Um, toxic does not mean a man, how, how a man sits on the subway. No. Like, for God's sakes, there's no woman in the world that fragile that this, or at least there shouldn't be. But when we say toxic, I think most of the time what we're talking about is narcissistic behavior, histrionic behavior, um, antisocial behavior, um, and borderline personality people who are essentially acting in a way that is purely selfish, purely driven by insecurity, and um, and and blind. And they, they they wreak an unbelievable amount of havoc. Yeah. Because the rest yeah. of us who are reasonably, I mean, everyone's got their stuff. Everyone's got depression yeah. or anxiety or difficult chapters in life. But for the most part, the, the, the people who are more or less on a pretty even keel, regardless of struggle or, or, or difficulty, um, when you bump into people like this that are personality disordered, you don't necessarily know them for what they are. You you're a good person so you're you're a good trustworthy person and so you trust and assume goodness in the people you encounter and you say wow this person's really hurting this person has really been wrong done you know has had wrong done to them and 
I should really listen and I should learn and I should really get educated because, wow, like this, this is a really terrible thing and I need to do this for this person. And then you're in this codependent thing or, or whatever. But, but I think a lot of the time we just use this kind of handy cast off term and we call it toxic. And then just for extra, oomph, we throw a masculinity on, on the end of it. And I think uh, that's not really what we mean. That's just a very lazy shortcut to talk, you know, and I, I, I just, so much of our conversation nowadays has to start out with, okay, so when you say toxic, what do you mean exactly? So are we talking about open legs on the subway? Or are we talking about, uh, you know, uh, actual direct manipulation of the truth? Um, and, and it's like, Again, for me, it is blind is the blind is part of this because or or the opposite of it, awareness. And again, this is why one of my core beliefs and wishes or hopes is that we collectively, individually, become better at reflecting, at looking at ourselves, at seeing what is it that I'm doing and what's the response? Yeah. What happens when I, and what happens when I, you know, it's like, if I shift this, what then? If I think this, what then? So that there is this constant, and, and I have, I mean, I've only come to do this in the past 20 years, I lived 30 years without this because I was so harsh towards myself that mm -hmm. I didn't dare reflect openly and honestly because I was toxic towards myself. I was beating myself up so much for anything yeah. that I found within me that I deemed to be unworthy, not desirable, you know, wrong, that I wouldn't even go there. So opening, opening up that for me has really been part of the, the part of the journey where I today can say, oops, I so fucking screwed up when I said or did or, you know, that email or when I said that to you or whatever it is that I do, right? To actually be able to own that for me is is a part of all of this it's like because if yeah. i can't look at myself and and actually question myself and go ha huh, you know question not 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 punish myself not throw myself under the bus not put myself in jail, you know, not kill myself because you're not worthy, you know, but when I can look at myself and see, oh, that was really not one of my better choices. Yeah. That's when I can start to dance with all of me, with all of the shadow side of me as well. Um, yeah. Well, and it's, I think it, it starts, I mean, we're sort of dancing around on two different things that are kind of the, the same thing in, in some ways. I think about asking, when you said reflecting, I feel like a lot of the time when we do get into these sticky and difficult conversations, people get very upset when you ask them to define their terms, just so that you can establish a baseline that we can say, well, but when you say this, what do you mean? And they'll say, well, ugh, I mean that. And you say, yeah, but okay, that, why exactly are you, uh, tell me a little bit more about why you define it that way. And does that include this? And does that include that and that and that? And, and just so that you can try to at least be talking, not at cross purposes, that you, you actually are talking about the same thing. They, yeah. And even in asking people, a lot of the time when you're talking to people, you can just tell by how they're, they get very agitated that you would even dare to ask them to define what they mean when they use the word hate or what they mean when they say the word, when they talk about fear or I just feel like such and such and such. Well, why? 
Um, because, because we're not in the habit of defining our terms right now. We are supposed to take someone's words as they intend them with no concern for how they land on someone else who may have a different perspective. Because the assumption is that of course you wouldn't have a different perspective and you know exactly what I'm saying because you would think the same thing, right? Because you're one of us, you're not one of the bad people. And, and so you, you certainly don't want to antagonize anybody, but I can't answer the question you're asking me until I ask you, what do you mean by the word nation? What do you mean by the word woman? What do you mean by the word sex? What do you mean by the word uh, assault? Uh, because I think women in particular, um, in, in my experience, want to feel like they are saying the right things. There's a lot more, we put a lot more pressure on each other to say the right things and to look like you're one of the good guys without a whole lot of thought as to the logical underpinnings of what we're saying and why we're saying things the way we're saying. And so when you ask someone, can you tell me more about what you mean by that? Um, there's this instant annoyance, like you're interrupting my point, you're interrupting your agreement with my with my argument, but I'm like, no, it's not an argument because it's just a whole lot of Twitter hashtags is what I'm hearing yeah. coming yeah. out of your mouth. Yeah, but I don't, I don't know what I don't know what I don't know what you mean. Yeah, like tell me, it's like that that GIF of Steve Carell in in the office. Tell it to me again, like I'm four years old. Yeah, like I because I'm not, you know, really we should assume that we're talking to people who are not on our side. But, you know, so that we can try to actually walk them through the rationale and, and the logic and the progression of where we've gotten to where we are. And then the person may say, that's not how I see it. And then at that point, you then say, well, how do you see it? Yeah. yeah. What led you to, to believe what you, so, to, so you see? You clarity know? is kindness has been one of my my. No. companion tropes for clarity is deeply triggering <laughs> clarity yes, is the devil but it is it is kind of <laughs> the clearer i am about just that mm. what is it that i mean the the easier it is because then yeah. you know then you don't have to assume that oh she's one of the good guys then you'll either know or you'll know that oh my god she's not one of the good guys what do i do now it is kinder than leaving yeah. you in the dark but it's interesting because it also has made me professionally. I've been last week I was away doing machine factory acceptance testing and, and at the same time working on layout suggestions and trying to make my points clear about why am I concerned about this, the way the design is here, this door there. What are my concerns? Because we got some feedback and it was like, mm, we need to clarify more. So just the yeah, just the habit of responding or making my point come across and trying to be as clear as I can be. So that, yes, in a sense, I am explaining it as if you're four years old, but I'm yeah. not being condescending. I'm just... Right trying my hardest to make the language work in our favor yeah, so that you exactly. don't have to assume and I don't have to assume, but rather it's, yeah. it's clear and it's, it's tricky. And, you know, I've been, I've been working this project for almost three years and my clarity, my, my, ability to make my point come across in writing or in speaking has really improved because I've had that as as one of my um you know guiding lights I clarity yeah. is kindness how can I share yeah. what I know what I see what I experience what I fear what I'm concerned about in such a way that you can have a better chance at receiving it of course what it is yeah. that I'm actually sending um and I had um in the Tankespian 
Patreon community where we have the monthly 90 minute Zooms. We had mm. the topic of creativity, I think one and a half years ago, which was so interesting because we, we have these fantastic conversations uh, where people can, can just share and, and creativity from my point of view I wouldn't believe that to be a sticky conversation topic, but mm, you'd be surprised. Everything can be. Yeah. So it was like, what's the definition of creativity? And I would say towards the end of those 90 minutes, on a collective level, the 10 of us or so that were in the conversation, we could probably have started to come up with a, a, a shared definition by then to I everybody can come on and come, can come in and kind of say this is what I see but to make it what's then a shared definition of it what's what's a definition of creativity that all of us involved here can can come to we didn't we didn't go down that road and and we would probably have had to have another 90 minutes to get to it but it also made me see the importance of like you say being in the conversation in such a way that I share clearly, as clear as I can, what it is I see. From my perspective, this is it. And you say, from your perspective, is this. Somebody else says, from their perspective, is yeah. this. So that we, if nothing else, gain this understanding that, oh yeah, right, I am not the one who's sitting on the answer. I'm just sitting mm -hmm. on my personal belief, my personal answer. You're sitting on yours. Yeah. Do they overlap? Are they almost identical? Or are they like three meters apart? And it's, yeah. it's, it's letting ourselves stay in those conversations. That can be kind of frustrating, but yeah. oh, so rewarding. Because that's when it's like, then we kind of have the playing field. It's, it's like that fog bank has just gone away. All of a sudden, you can see the ground again. Aha, yeah. there's a rock over there. I didn't see that because there was fog. Yeah, yeah precisely. Well, we think, I think we enter into conversations like that now, buttressed by hashtags, yeah. wearing an armor to go into this kind of, with, with this intention of protecting our point of view, as opposed to sharing our point of view, yeah. which is, it, it, it sounds like um, maybe semantics, but it so changes the tenor of conversation when you feel like people are going in with the old fashioned kind of knight's armor with the, with the actual like tiny slits for eyes. And you, you couldn't even see someone like right here because yeah. you're just seeing yeah. through these tiny slits. You're, you're, you're impenetrable. Yeah, exactly. you're, and you're the shining knight. You're going to protect everyone and everything, even, even you. And you're going to put away all of the bad guys and you're going to, you're this kind of hero, but you also, you, you can't move. Like you can't, you can't. And if you fall down, anybody. you can't get up. If you, if fall, you fall down into the water, you'll drown. If you get exactly. off your horse, you won't be able to get yeah. on <laughs> without help. And it's ironic to me that so much of the flavor of the discourse now is all about tolerance, tolerance, tolerance. Oh, I don't like that. Of art. course, like everything else nowadays in in the upside down world. It's exactly about the opposite. It's a, it's about enforcing intolerance. Yeah. Here are all the things you need to be personally intolerant of, and you need to perform that intolerance. You need to make sure that you do it vigorously. You need to make sure that you do it across all these channels. You need to make yeah, sure that you do it at, at Thanksgiving dinner. It needs to be seen. And 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 when you ask someone those simple questions, like, well, what? tell me more about why, why you feel that way that implies that you're not wearing armor, that you don't mind how someone sees you, that you don't mind. It's not that you don't care, but you don't mind. And there's a big difference in those 
those, those two things. When you enter into a conversation with your armor off and people will look at you like, you're, you're clearly not patriotic to the cause that you're not wearing your armor. And I'm, you know, aren't you afraid of getting wounded? Aren't you afraid of people seeing you as weak? Aren't you afraid of people seeing you as, as, as being on the wrong side? You're not easily identifiable as being one of us. And when you ask people questions in the interest of clarity, without having anything to protect, whether it's your reputation or a, a particular relationship, um, you, I think it's very close. Once again, it's going off into the air again. When you don't have anything to protect, yes, this is it. You end up, I think, really questioning the need for armor. And that really pisses people off who are really attached to their armor because they don't want to think. They and it scares clarity. them to they death. They don't want tolerance at all. They are very comfortable being intolerant mm -hmm. and casting casting judgment on everyone else around them and so when you when you don't play when you're like you know well I, I i'm not really sure about that i don't know much about that you know i have some reservations because of x y and z um and and the fact that you're even a little bit off track or that you're asking them to explain themselves walk me through this um it's extremely um it feels like a confrontation for those people because mm -hmm. you are not just asking them to explain their point of view that they would think should be an assumed truth. You are asking them to acknowledge that they have their armor on and that I'm not wearing the same armor. And that throws the whole game, the whole performance into question. Mm -hmm. Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. Why, because you know, I don't mind if you see the world differently than I do. Because this is another thing is we, we employ the concept of uh, the most ridiculous two words put together I can ever fathom, lived experience. Mm -hmm. What experience exactly was not lived? <laughs> As a writer, I beg you, please stop it. Stop. Don't ever use those words ever again, everybody. Because it, it anyway. The lived experience, the fact that you would say that your armor is built of your lived experience and therefore it cannot be questioned. How can you not see if you have any logic left in your brain that my point of view is going to be based on my lived experience? You, you have to acknowledge that everyone's perspectives, opinions, beliefs, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, their 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 respective uh, truth or lens on the world is based on Bears. what they have experienced to this point in their lives. Yes. They have different information than you do. But you have, have the wrong lived experience. Ah, that's have it. the wrong one, Kate, because right. mine is the right one. I know. I know. Yeah, it's, it's, I, I, I am at the point now where I've, I've, I've come and done enough that my armor is off. And when I see someone behaving in that way, I just think, oh, honey, like it, it doesn't, it doesn't make me feel as frightened as it used to, because I used to think I'm about to lose this friend because I can smell the intolerance in the air that I can smell that they can smell that my lived experience has, uh, I can't believe I just used that word seriously. It's now, now it's in my head. Ah! Get it out, get it out. So um, I had yeah. in the... Point is, I don't feel that way anymore, so... Like, in the winter, just... I had a... In one of the therapy sessions with Dominic, I... I really, really, really got a sense of the fact that I have always believed, you know, I think most people feel that they have a wound where they are vulnerable. Oh, yeah. and it's really sore and you really want to yeah. protect it and hide it and shield it and, and to put it way down in the cellar somewhere. Or, or do this. Which, which is precisely the thing that I realized in that session, which was mm -hmm. 
it's not to be hidden away. That's what I front with. If I front with my wound, if that's what I come bearing open, shit, the connection that's possible, shit, the oh, level yeah. of honesty yeah. that can open up, and shit, it can scare the hell out of people, for sure, that have their wounds so deeply down in their cellar. But that's the that's like, so all of a sudden, that totally shifted the way that I look at me and the way that I look at the world, actually. It's like, okay, so when I feel extra vulnerable, when I feel that, okay, we're really approaching what is my core wound, that's a signal that I'm on the right track, not the wrong track. I'm on the right track. It's like, yes, more of that. That is yeah. where I mm -hmm. do the work that only I can do in the world is when I'm following that signal. And I just went, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Because I can't do that and wear armor. Does yeah. not compute. It's not possible to do that. How does that jive with, I think, both of our contempt for identity, though? So I, so, and stoicism, right? This is the thing. Everything you're saying, I'm listening to, and oh, God, totally, 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 yes, yes, yes. But at the same time, people who come forward into a conversation holding this, this the golem's ring in their hand and saying, this is my pain equals this is my credibility. This is why I am not to be questioned. This is but my that's victimization. Not it, though. This is my that's oppression. Not it, no? though. For me, that's okay. not it at all. For me, it doesn't mm. say I'm not to be questioned at all. For me, it's basically just yeah. saying, here I am naked. Mm. Yeah, right. no, I wasn't You're, saying that you were saying I, that, but I think yeah, people yeah, but I mean, employ it that's, in that that's, way where they come forward kind of trauma first, pain first, and, and it becomes the thing that yeah. enters the room before they do. And, yeah. and it becomes it becomes a crutch for them yes. in conversation or in relationship. And then you're and like, still wearing yeah. a type of armor. Then you're exactly. still not it. Then you're still not. Because, again, I think yeah. that you have to be naked here, you know, as a, as a mm -hmm. metaphor. It is that. It is when I'm naked in my... And in a sense, we are all born with that wound and of that wound. We come out of a uh, of a mother's womb with an umbilical cord attached to us. Yeah. And that's where the wound is. We are that, you know, it comes there. We are born with it. It's 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 us. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think the When when I had that insight and when I've been I've yeah. been like dancing with this, I've been playing with this, I've been I've been sensing this, I've been I've been working it in a way for yeah. for you know five months maybe. It is the feeling that somehow I am. I'm shedding all of my armor. I'm I'm dropping all of my weapons. Yeah. I'm 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 letting go of that. Yeah. So am I vulnerable? Heck yeah. But am I yeah. powerful? Heck yeah. Right, right. In me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm doing a lot of thinking about this exact thing lately, because obviously I lost a child, you know, 15 years ago and wrote a book about grief and, and what I went through and founded a community for um, parents of bereaved parents, basically. Um, and, and I wrote a lot about it and I thought a lot about it in terms of how we, what vulnerability is um, versus people wearing armor in the way you describe who had infant loss and never spoke of it again. Mm. And uh, versus people who were kind of openly bleeding 
which is the way I thought of myself, even though I, I was doing really well, but at the same time, I was, I, I would not forget about it. I would not, um, you know, it, it's, 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 it's a profoundly disordered thing to have to go through when people have seen your pregnant belly and they thought you had twins and there's only one baby in the stroller. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's something that you're almost forced into vulnerability with a loss like that because everyone knows you are pregnant with twins and it's not something you can keep to yourself. And I am now, you know, 15 years later, something totally unrelated has come up for me that's really deeply wrong with my body. And, and I'm, I'm looking for Jocko Willink as opposed to, because it's something that at least so far, you wouldn't know it to look at me. And so I'm in this kind of zone where I think I could keep this to myself. Why tell people? Because I don't know how I feel about it yet. Well, I do now. I'm scared as fucking hell. Because I don't know yet what I'm going to be capable of in the future, what the future looks like. To be fair, we never know. None of us know that. Sure. But there are people out there that have what I have been confirmed to have who hashtag the fuck out. of it, And they go out into the world and they label themselves as, as you know, what they label themselves as and 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 it becomes this journey that they document that they're on and i i look at that and i think how is that different from what i did when liam died i don't know like i, I just i don't know why i feel like I, i've had to tell people here and there because they're like why aren't you drinking have a beer have these french fries you know why aren't you eating this food why did you bring a little baggie of freaking carrot sticks to the party and and so there's been a few moments where I'm like, I, I just have to tell some of the people that I socialize yeah. with a lot because it's so apparent that my behavior is so different because um, I'm trying to give myself the best shot I can. But there are people that I've known for decades, for my whole life that don't know. And I'm, I'm burying this deep into the podcast and, and they'll probably never see it here anyway, but but, I, but it's just, it's, I'm thinking so much lately about the difficult things that happen to us in our lives, the pain, the trauma, the diagnoses, which ones we share and why, and which ones we don't and why. And right now, because we are so permeable with our pain, because we wear it so much, and it is such a currency to have pain of some kind, because it gives you an excuse, it gives you extra attention. It gets you more sympathy. It gets you more credibility. It gets you all kinds of access to this kind of social power. Um, but I'm more interested in, at this point, because everyone is doing that, and because I get my back up at doing what everyone else is doing, I'd rather keep my hashtag to myself and just see where that serves me and how that, where that takes me and how that serves me. Because it feels to me like there's a certain power in not letting people look at me and seeing that work. Cause I would, if someone told me that they have what I have, I'd be like, Oh my God, holy shit. And I'd go home and throw salt over both shoulders just in case. And I would, I, I don't know that I'd ever look at that person again and not be like, Oh, I wonder how she's doing. I don't want to ask. I don't know if I should ask. So I, I sort of, there's a, there's, a, there's a part of me that is, is leaning more toward stoic thinking. And something that someone said once that really resonated with me, which is be careful of what you share with people mm -hmm. because only certain people deserve to get all your perspective, all your news, all your difficulty, because not everyone can shoulder that. And maybe they shouldn't have to. And maybe it's something that I should keep quietly to myself because I don't want to wear it like a sandwich board. I don't want to walk through the world being that woman who ended up catching that particular bullet. I would rather keep it to myself and like my immune system, keep it from going into 
from, from relapsing. I need to keep it steady and quiet, like calm. the dragon. I need yeah. to keep it calm. And if I go out there with all the freaking hashtags, trying to get all kinds of attention and getting all kinds of sympathy and building my brand as, as a hashtag immune warrior, then I'm going to start buying into that shit. And what I need is to be tough as goddamn nails for the rest of my life. In a it's way Yoko, that I'm like, it's Yoko. <laughs> ah, like, and this is not going to become me. This is not going to define me. This is not going to be what other people are going to see. They're going to see me skiing. They're not even going to know. And I don't need them to know because I already think highly of enough of myself. When I'm a 72 year old skier, I will already be secure enough in knowing what I know about myself that I'm still doing that. I don't need to have other people admiring me because, oh, she's the one with them. So, so I've been thinking a lot. It's, it's all like different tracks of different kinds of difficulty and how we wear it. Sometimes we can't help but share it. Sometimes we keep it secret. I guess I'm at the point where I don't feel like it's always necessarily a form of repression to keep something no. to yourself, so, you know? When, when I think... First of all, I think that, you know, we are each on our personal journeys where we are. What yeah. will serve you now might not have served you when you were a bereaved mother, or it might have served you, you don't know, but you weren't there. You were where yeah. you were, right? So yeah. that's kind of the first yeah. aspect of it. It's like you have come to this now, already having gone through a shitload of shit. So maybe you are reacting differently today. You probably are. You are because of what you have learned about yourself from previous yeah, experience. Maybe, right? maybe but it's context. But I would yeah. also say that when I speak about when I speak about this wound that is mine, it isn't to quote you my lived experience. It isn't the, <laughs> don't the, attach that to me. No, no. The, the, it isn't the the current yeah. issue that I'm speaking about, it isn't, oh, I have this diagnosis or I've had this happen to me or I'm in this quandary yeah. of some sort. That's not it. It is more stripped down into like, it, it's kind of beyond personality somehow. It's like, when I, when I feel, so for me, what this wound, is for me is the I I feel it when I am connecting completely. So I have one I had one experience last winter when I was going to Dominic to therapy. I parked my bike, I crossed the road, I came uh, I was walking over to the office and a biker came and it was kind of slippery. So he slipped on his bike and he fell. Mm -hmm. And I looked out my shoulder at him, saw that he slipped and saw that he got up, you know, the way that we do and, and kind of, oh, I'm okay. Yeah. And I kept walking, but then I stopped. And this is the thing that I'm speaking about. I stopped, mm -hmm. I turned and I made sure that he was okay. Yeah, that connection for me is that is my wound. That is that opening in me that somehow just it, you know it 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 connects me in ways that that I don't I so don't experience it always. Mm -hmm. But when I do, I know what I what that is, and. I am absolutely 100% certain that that person, the man who fell on the bike, felt it. He experienced this. He, he sensed that I was there. All of me was there, just making sure that he's okay. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I walked in and then we had an entire session just diving into this aspect, right? And then a year later, the insight hit me that, oh yeah, when I do that, when I am on the verge of, of, of being so open that I kind of let go of what I should or shouldn't or what people think or doesn't think, when I'm just there, yeah. that is the gift of me. So it isn't, I have this diagnosis or this is my problem or I've just divorced or, you know, it's like, that's not the wound uh, that I speak of. It is this, de it's deeper somehow. It's, it's more, yeah, I don't, I don't know how to explain it more than, but that experience, which is such a mundane little thing. Yeah, but I love my it. feeling, because when I walked up and into the office to Dominic, I was in tears. I was in tears explaining this, the sensation of this, of how I felt this man. I was, because I was just there. There were, you yeah. know, it's like Jill Bolte Taylor, the, the brain scientist who had the stroke. Right, yeah. She, she experienced how kind of these boundaries that we put in place, they just disappeared. And then she was boundaryless for a long time. And then she started to build up these boundaries again. Of, okay, okay, this is my hand. You're bringing me a piece of toast. It's not the same thing as me. You know, she had these coolest experience and it's kind of that so it's when everything is dissolved that is what is me that is what remains of me when everything else is gone that connection bit and if i open with that wow am i afraid to do that holy fuck yeah i am yeah because i think i will be too much or i will be woo woo or you know or I'll ruin somebody's night because they're bugging me about why I'm not drinking. And it's like, okay, I'll tell you. Yeah. And then it's, it's just this like horrible dark cloud. Uh, okay. And no matter how I try to be like, yeah, you know, it's fine. And I, I'm doing this and I'm doing that. And this is just yeah. life now and whatever, but it's still just everyone's face is just kind of like, it's the yeah. biggest womp womp you could possibly put on a party. So yeah, it's, which is but, also yeah. because we're so bad at the sticky conversations. I know. We don't know how to deal with that. If somebody yeah. comes and tells me they're dying or they have this thing or they lost a baby or they have cancer and you meet them on the street, you go, no, I don't want to go over there because I don't know what to say. Yeah, because we don't yeah. do sticky conversations enough. No, more no. of them. We need more of them. I could somehow understand it more with a dead child because I have a lot of empathy for people that have, that will never, for the vast majority of people that will never have to have a dead child in their arms. Yeah. Like I get it. It, it is almost the most backwards mm -hmm. kind of cosmic injustice mm -hmm. that is very rare. Thank God. Um, that most people will never know that. We'll never have to carry that memory. Um, so I could understand people turning away from me. I was like, I'm Medusa now. And I'm just going to be Medusa for probably at least a decade. People are going to see me and go, oh, God, and look the other way. Because they're going to see me and they're going to see dead baby. And, and they're going to stammer and, and stagger and ask me about the weather and then carry on their way because they don't know what to say. But with... With what, with what it is now, which is a more chronic kind of a thing. It's not just bad news that's going to then kind of go into my history. It's going to be bad news that is going to grow up into mm -hmm. my history. It's, it's not going anywhere. It's not going to fade with time. It's going to increase with time. And, and um, so it's... I, I'm in this weird situation where I know people are bad at these conversations, even friends I've had for a long time. And I think being vulnerable to me now is, do I want to 
give that person a chance to let me down? Mm-hmm. Or do I want to just say, you know what, maybe some other time, maybe I just want to have a fun night tonight and I don't want to get into it again. So, you know, and maybe I just don't want to put myself in a situation where, you know, somebody just says something to me because they don't know what else to say. And they're like, oh, I knew someone who had that once and they were in a wheelchair and agoraphobic for the rest of their life. And I'm like, thank you, but no. (laughs) People, people, the things people say is really... I I don't know if it's because they can't really understand that this is real, but I, I'm still grappling with it myself. So I'm still kind of in a point where I don't know that I'm entirely ready to receive a disappointing performance from someone else. Mm-hmm. So that's why I've been kind of holding it as close as I can, except with acquaintances, which is a bit like, I've got to tell people that I would usually drink with mm-hmm. because they're going to see that pretty soon and they're going to give me a hard time about it. Um, you know, lovingly and, 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 and in a light humor kind of a way, but, but in terms of like, I, I really am at a point now where I'm like, what am I looking for when I share that? And I think that's something that we should all examine. Yeah. Um, there's obviously vulnerability on one side, which is a wonderful thing. However, there's, something more, and I'm not saying they're opposed to each other, but there is a form of stoicism on the other side, which is the stubborn refusal in my mind to let something become you. Yeah. And it, it, it's not, like I said, it's not necessarily opposed to vulnerability. But isn't, but... isn't it about the victimhooding of it? If I, yeah. if I cloak yeah. my, my vulnerability in, in, in a victim coat. Yeah, I am x because y yes yeah it's something like that it's just it's it's something i'm kind of thinking through and i, and I think i'm trying to take that pause whether it's at a dinner party or in a conversation with a friend that hasn't seen me in a long time or someone that just looks at me and goes whoa cheekbones what are you doing differently <laughs> like mm-hmm. uh and there's mm-hmm. always this moment like i'm looking over the cliff and i'm like do i want to do i feel like jumping today mm-hmm. I don't know. I, 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 I'm not really sure how to deliver that news and not ruin a night or deliver that news and not give someone a chance to say some asshole thing in, re- in return that is just so unhelpful. It's, but then I can't hold it against them because it is a horrifying thing. And I, maybe I would have said something similar. I don't know. People just reach for the closest thing yeah. they've heard yeah. and they splurt it out at you because they just want to say something and so they say like the worst possible thing and sometimes I just don't have the energy to receive no. that which I, I just, think is wise yeah which I think is what you know that is that is also part of what reflection gives isn't it it's like the 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 knowledge the awareness of Am I, you know, am I resourced enough for yeah. this or not? If not, yeah. don't. And and what am I, if you think of every every interaction as an exchange, what am I looking to receive yeah. from this exchange? So if we're having an argument about culture or politics at a dinner table, if we are, um, if we have big news that we, we might want to disclose, but we're not really sure that we're in the right headspace in that moment, or, or in any interaction, what am I looking to receive in this? What is, what's my point? So it's not just this kind of blanket, I share everything with everyone. No. Because that starts to be a sort of discernment. a Discernment. This is right, discernment. Right. So yeah. I was in a, a Daughters of the Flame group for three weeks last winter and she was speaking about it's about Bridget uh Irish goddess yada yada who also Mm -hmm. exists in in other places but she spoke about her Bridget's sort of discernment and I went oh I like that so using your sort of discernment wisely uh, to serve you it's like okay not that today you cut that one off this today okay i don't need to use it you know 
So yeah. for me, that was um, that was a, a a metaphor that I really that really hit home for me when she was telling the story. Tara Y was telling the story of the sort of discernment. I just went, mm. "Oh yeah." <laughs> It's like, yeah, I that's love that. the one that I walk with and I have it with me always. Am I using it or not? Mm. Am I being discerning or not? And it is a matter of, of well-being. It is a matter of making sure that I can be as healthy as I can be, as, as well as I can be, connecting to my inner well of being. And I have to use the sort of discernment in order to, to mm -hmm. have that. And that is when I am well-being and when I am connected to that well of being within me, that yeah. is when I am of the most service to both me and everybody else. Even if someone yeah. might say that, oh, you're such a whatever, whatever. It's like, yeah, but I, if I'm doing it in a way that I'm preserving myself so that tomorrow when I have this much more important thing to do, I can do that and be there. Right choice. Yeah. I mean, that's the reflection that you were talking about is being able to, I know that there was a, a very, uh, strange kind of cultish weird course that uh, that that I took many 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 years ago um that was kind of a personal growth thing that um a family member signed me up for and it, uh, so I took it and the one interesting thing that that I got from it was that they said that in every interaction that we have or in every mode of behavior we we, we employ we are getting a payoff. Yeah. So even when you have a negative experience, you're, you're doing it, you're driving that negative experience because you are boosting yourself up. You are, you are, you are paying yourself you're, something. Yeah, you're you getting are proving, something. Yeah. You're proving that the world is against you. You are proving that, that you are superior to everyone else who is a bigot. You are proving that the reason that you haven't had the success you have in life is because you're female or because you're this or because you're that. And um, th it's, I, I, I do find myself in, in these moments now, whether it's in arguments, uh, an argument, I don't mean a, a, an argument, I mean just in arguing a point um, that I, I take that moment and I didn't before because before a few years ago when I first started asking a lot of questions, and you know, started to unplug from the the, the trough of mass media. Um, I I would enter into conversations just absolutely like like a bad wire, like just like electric, like oh my god, have you like why like what like I was angry because I felt so betrayed by all the institutions and by the media and by the fact that, of course I can ask that question. What? Like, I, I was just, I couldn't, all of a sudden I could see and it was very painful. Um, but now, now that my, all my edges, edges have softened quite significantly and I enter into those conversations thinking, am I feeling like this? Am I feeling like there's a, like that feeling that you get from slamming a door? Yeah. When you're yeah. really angry and it lasts about half a second, that gratification um, does nothing for you. It only galvanizes the worst in us. But there's a moment of satisfaction when you slam the door. When you call that person a Nazi because they said that, you know, they said the wrong thing about people opening their legs on the subway, <laughs> whatever it is. And, and I, I'm sort of examining that to myself. Like, what, what am I getting if I go down this path, if I chase this electric feeling, am I just going to feel like I'm exercising that, that rage, that anger? What, what is that at the expense of? And so I, I feel the same way about this terrible news and, and, and the vulnerability, what you could think of as vulnerability of sharing that moment. Ultimately, you have to repeat it over and over and over again, and it does become narcissism. You're making a moment all about you 
you are reorienting everyone else around you to your suffering and your terrible outlook of your possibly terrible future. And you are changing the energy of that room indelibly. And do I really need to do that? Like, what, what would I get from that? I would get a moment of, oh, what? That I would be like, yeah, this is an unbelievable thing that's happening to me and it's really scary. And there would be that slam door half a second, like, oh, they're really scared for me too. And it's this little sort of pump up. Yeah, it's thing a vindication of sorts. Yeah. It, it's, a, it's, it's a sort of like, okay, well, I'm right to be really upset about this because this yeah. is really scary because look at how scared they all are. But then after you slam a door, it's embarrassing. Mm-hmm. You've acted like a child. Like you've, you're not being stoic. You're, you're indulging your, your weakest impulses. And so I've had a few moments lately where I've been like, I could tell this person right now the truth, technically the truth about what's going on or why my cheekbones are suddenly cheekbonier or why, why I'm not drinking or whatever happened with that thing, that symptom that I mentioned six months ago. Um, but you know what? I'm just going to sort of let it slide tonight and I'm just going to laugh it off. I'm going to change the subject. And then the moment kind of passes and I don't slam the door and I don't hold it against the person that they don't know. It's okay. And then a moment later, the person starts telling me about, you know, about their dog that, that died and how, how broken up they are. And I think if I had have gone out and blurted and slammed my door and, and come at you with a cast iron skillet of my terrible news, we wouldn't have had this moment where I can give something of myself to you um, that helps me to get outside of my freaking body and, and into someone else's life and actually contribute something to you. And then I walk away from that and I have not taken something from the room greedily, but I've given something to the room. And so it's not always to say that sharing difficult things is sucking, is being an energy vampire. No, because it isn't. No, but sometimes but it, it is. can be precisely. Yeah, it like, can be like and, everything and, and, else. Yeah. And it's vampiric on me. It's yeah. it, it ultimately costs me to go around repeating yeah. that all the time. Yeah. I don't want to get used to that narrative. Yeah. I don't want it to become so familiar to me that this, that I start wearing it like a, like a sweater, like a cloak. Yeah. So it's, it's been really interesting kind of gauging these moments and thinking a lot about vulnerability and, and when it comes to this disease, I don't want to be vulnerable at all. Mm-mm. I want to be Jocko. I have to be. I haven't got a choice. So I am not particularly interested in the fucking touchy feelings on this one. I'm not interested in having these moments of disclosure or using the hashtags or getting all kinds of people I don't even know on Instagram to tell me how sorry they are for me. Because that's just going to poison my, my own well with kindness. And I don't, I, I can't afford that. I need to keep my well as quiet and calm and as friggin' crystal clear as I can. Yeah. So, so it's just been interesting thinking about the difference, you know, the, the virtues of stoicism, even if it's not necessarily a versus, versus what now passes today as vulnerability, which is so much of a performance and not often genuine like the guy on the bike. No. No. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the um, context again is, is such an important aspect of it. It's like when you are in need of being held when your news can be received in such a way that you are held is something else than when your news is taken in such a way that okay it didn't it didn't do anything good for me it didn't it didn't serve me it didn't serve the other person no and now exactly yeah right and i think that that is where again, the reflection and the sort of discernment is so vital. And I'm, I'm guessing a lot of the people who are doing the hashtag vulnerability 
thing. It's kind of like you said before. It's like, that's what we do now. This is how it's done, right? Yeah, so no. I have to do it. And so you do it without the reflection and without using your personal discernment. Because it's also, Join in. when do I, when don't I? Do I go public, yeah. public, so that everybody will always know? Or do I say yeah. it to a chosen few? It, it, it's individual, but I would want everybody to make that choice by themselves. And that's hard because so yeah. much of what I believe, if I start to unravel those or follow those threads, Oh man, I'll see, this is what we're supposed to do today. And this is how we're supposed to be. And these are the hashtags, you know? So it's like, what, what is actually mine? What comes from me? What's my needs? What's my wishes? What's my desires? What's my setting and surrounding? What's my current mood? What's my state of mind? Yeah. Where am I at? It all plays a part. The hashtags right now are feeling to me like, you know, the candy lining the front walk up to the candy cottage. Yeah. And Hansel yeah. and Gretel are like, yeah. ooh, 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 there's another house. Oh, oh. And and then they're in the candy cottage with the bad witch. And yeah. and and that's what so much of it is. And it's it's really it's social media. It's it's social media encouraging us to identify with labels. Yes. And sometimes I see people kind of sharing diagnoses, they're sharing um, mental health struggles or whatever it is, but they're doing it in a way that uh, that, that, that I would never ever mm -hmm. want. It, they're doing it in a way that feels like they struck the jackpot. Mm -hmm. Like it's something exciting they can now put in their bio that I am this thing, I am this disorder. This is how my brain works. I'm and, and I'm like, what? How is that going to serve you? Why not focus on what you do, what you create, what you're passionate about, what kind of a parent you are, as opposed to uh, this is my list of disabilities or 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 mental. And isn't this also or, a part of the 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 hype of of uh, identity politics? It's like. The more yeah. hashtags I can stack on my CV, the more subjects I am allowed to talk about. I am allowed to, yeah. to give the answers and I'm allowed to say, you can't give that or you can't ask that question because, hey, you, you're lacking this hashtag on your CV. So instead of seeing that, yeah. okay, yeah. you have this thing, you have this experience, what do you need? You know, who are mm -hmm. you yeah. in this right now? And here's somebody else who has the same thing. Who are they? You might have the complete opposite experience from, from mm -hmm. what this is, what it means. Someone gets strong, someone gets weak. Someone feels I have to find, you know, they changed their entire life. Someone clings to what they know and won't. Yeah. Is there, you know, there's there is no one. There is no one answer. It is yeah. it is personal. It is the individual. But I'm speaking for me from me. And I should be very careful with speaking for everyone who has this hashtag. No. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's... I have this hashtag and the way I perceive it is this. Okay, fine. That makes sense. Because then you could maybe find another one who says, oh yeah, mm -hmm. I have this as well. I experienced this this way. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I I don't I don't know. I Identity is a tricky thing because some identities are okay to appropriate and some aren't, especially who, as an author. And who, and who <clears throat> is the judge? Mm. The mob. And who's the mob? The mob is the judge. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, 
the people, I, I mean, it's, well, here's, here's an example. So, you know, someone once came up to me after hearing me talk, I, I had given a, a, a speech somewhere about creativity and grief. And she came up to me and she said, oh my gosh, that was so amazing and blah, 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 blah. And because I talked a little bit about what happened just as a bit of a springboard. Um, and she said, I've, she said very sheepishly, she said, I feel kind of, I feel kind of weird because I'm writing a novel right now about this woman who's like had a bunch of her children die. And I'm like, oh, of course, of course. Because it's it's like in, in the grief community, especially in infant loss, we know this trope very, very well. If you want to drive a female character insane, like That's Glenn Close and Fatal Attraction and saying, kill her baby. Yeah. It's a thing. Yeah. Mission if accomplished. You really, yeah. yeah, if you really want to push a female character to the brink of insanity and evil mm. and, and narcissism and cluster B nightmare, mommy dearest, horrible woman, you, you got to kill a baby or make it impossible for her to have a baby an infertility thing like in fatal attraction. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, I was like, this is, this is not new. Like <laughs> this is totally not in this life, but I just was like, okay. Like, and, and I said, well, why? Sure. I mean, people do that all the time, but the funny thing is being the mother of a dead child is not an identity. It's an experience. So as writers, we're all allowed to embody whatever experience we want. I could write from the perspective of being a murderer. I could write from the perspective of having been murdered as a ghost. I could write someone who has uh, divorced, not been divorced, someone religious, someone not religious, because these are all just the, 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 the experiences, what we have, right? But I would never be able to write, like, you know, she she came from several different minority groups, um, depending on how you define the word minority. I would never be able to write a book. Like to me, losing a child is um, something so formative that it crosses all of those lines, crosses all other labels. You can be Muslim in Jordan. You can be Christian in Kansas. You can be atheist in France. Uh, you can be single, married, divorced young, old, we are one in terms of the experience that we carry, it unifies us all. But the immutable character, characteristics that I have as an author do not allow me to write a story about a black refugee. That's not okay, because I don't have that experience. And so when she was telling me about her book, she was like kind of sheepish about it. She was like, look, I know I haven't gone through that. And I'm like, you're an author. So, if you're writing a novel, yeah. you're an author. It yeah. is your job to imagine yeah. experiences. That, I mean, you know, try not to slip into the tropes, but maybe too late. For that. <laughs> anyway, but it's your job to take a crack at yeah. it, to yeah. imagine things that you have no experience with. So go ahead. See if you can do a good job. Like, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's all the human experience. It's like actors don't have to actually be wizards. They can just play one on TV. Yeah. Yeah. That's their job. And so yeah. it, it has started to feel extremely arbitrary in terms of who is allowed to appropriate which types of identities and when. And it matters how many feathers you have in your quiver. If you're gay, if you're versus straight, if you are abled versus disabled, if you, and if you are this versus that then you might notch up a little bit in the pyramid yeah. of choice in terms of what yeah. you're allowed to write about. Yeah. But if you are just, you know, uh, if, if, you, if you don't have any quivers, I, I'm only just a woman, but I've got, I've got another quiver in there. You just can't see it, at least not yet. So it, it's just really, it, it's sad to me, the state of the arts in that way, that, that really short of, let's say, me telling the story of, uh, you know, an indigenous sort of heroic real life figure, I'm probably not the best person to, to take that story and try and sell it. Obviously there's just sort of a- uh, But who knows? General. Maybe you would, would do a crack job at it. Maybe you would just ace it. 
you don't know. Well, I only say that. I don't think that you would perhaps go for it, though. No, and that's that's saying, of course, I could write it. I can write whatever I want to write. But would I? Because there is a limited number of stories of that particular group of people. And I'm just going to go ahead and let them tell it. But yeah. So that is true in some cases, but when we're talking about fiction, when we're talking about things born of life experience, I feel like it is a terrible, terrible thing, socially and artistically, to restrain people only to this one static identity that you have connected yourself to by immutable characteristics. And you are not allowed to play anywhere else except in here. Yeah. Um, because it, it incentivizes everyone to do this with their pain and try to seek out more quivers. Oh, oh, oh I've got ADHD. Oh, oh, really? Well, I, I had this happen to me. Well, I've got, and so it starts to become this thing where everyone's kind of grasping like Pac-Man for little gold coins so that they can try yes. to justify their art yes. or justify their opinion. And, and I feel like whenever someone starts their opinion with, as a woman, I think that, t- no, just state your opinion. You don't need to qualify. Yeah. A man can have an opinion about women's issues because they're also men's issues as well. Yeah. Um, you it's know, uh, yeah. we, we, we are all sharing this planet together. And so the divisiveness is as terrible in art as it is in, in our social settings. At and parties, it makes me wonder know? about the concept of identity, first of all, when you, you know, it's like, what is that? What aspects of who I am are Mm. identity markers or characteristics? And and what isn't? What's the choice? Yeah. What Which ones will pay? Which ones will pay? Exactly. And also... There's a there's an on being episode with someone whose last name I think is Fisher, um, sexology sociologist who who has studied a lot of of about sex and and mm. relationship etc. Old lady, it's a lovely episode. It's 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 many years old by now, but she oh, says me. she's so fascinated by how so much of 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 the studies that are going on so much of the science is focused on the differences almost nobody yeah. studies the similarities and she says we are so similar there's so much that's that yeah. where we are alike and it's like but that wouldn't fit too well in the identity culture because it's like, no. it's like, that's too broad. It's like, okay, human. Yeah. Human. That's my identity. That no, no, we need you off. to, we need yeah. you to narrow it down because otherwise I can't categorize you sufficiently to know you. It's like, no. Yeah. So it's interesting, this thing about how the, and I mean, language is the same. It is there as a way to help us be able to be clear it is there to help us categorize x from y and it also gives us then the power to put labels on things and to really narrow things down to such an extent that that in and of itself can become a problem so it's like we need more sticky conversations i think that's kind of you know it's like, we do. yeah, we need to have these types of conversations where I don't really know. I might not even be sure about what I think myself, but I'm curious and I'm open and I'm willing to take in, to listen, to sit with, to let percolate and perhaps to vomit now and again going, oh, that one did not sit well with me. And, yeah. and you know, just try to, and then all of a sudden you vomit from something I say and I can go, wow I that one sits really well with me but you apparently got sick from it what happened there how is that possible to be in that curious explorative space together it's like more of that that's when people shut down that's when people shut down when they see you they say something you don't have the appropriate reaction in their eyes 
And then it's just, well, I guess that's what you are now. And then exactly, the because then I can't and, talk to you about it. It's like, no, this is the opening. Yeah. This is where it gets really interesting. I know. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's strange days. Strange Very, days. It's, it's funny that people think that we're living in such a secular world, but I actually think it's the opposite. I think we've gotten more and more and more and more religious, yeah, except I the religion so. is self-identifying as something yes. that it isn't. Yes. I've, I've said it's the same religion. thing. Yeah. Sweden is on the world values chart. We're at the very top <laughs> right corner of the, of the chart, like the most secularized country in the world. And I'm going from that type of religion yeah. but the secularism itself the individualism itself is it, it works the same way it has the same yeah markers um f- forms processes it's it is okay it's just incantations incantations yeah. trials uh yeah. professing you know professing one's yeah. faith yeah and you have so, the you know, you know you have the commandments the this is yes, what's okay course. here this is what's yep. okay over here yeah this is what can excommunicate you yep yep yeah yep it's definitely but we have to stop we've been speaking for two hours and 15 minutes or something have we it just goes by like that i know it's lovely <laughs> isn't it <laughs> It is. It's so good to talk to you always. Yeah. 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 I feel like we, we give, uh, we give your, your uh, Caspian a run for his money because we're always, I'm always speaking in these like long meandering, like runoff sentence. He has to try to choose a clip where he's just like, this is stop Actually, it. At some point, I am the one stop. who does that. I am oh, the really? one who does that, but he's the one who then fixes it. So well, I read, I read through the transcript that we get from Descript and I try to find snippets. Um, and yeah. I have, I am, I am actually using my sort of discernment more and more because I realize that I can snippetize and find so much that I think is worth putting out there, but then I don't use it. So I am aiming at never picking out more than 10 snippets. And then we have now put in another sort of discernment. So Camille then checks them and looks at them from outside and sees this actually makes sense when you're not either you or me, because we know the context of where, what, you know, what led that thing. Yeah. There's 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 an ongoing uh, process here of trying to make this, even more um yeah relevant i think in a sense or you know making sure that there is something that is understandable outside of course then the other snippets that aren't chosen i can use as inspiration for a blog post or whatnot and i have like two thousand of those inspirations so yeah i haven't blogged more than twice this year i think so that's not happening but sometime yeah Sometime it might exactly yeah well it's the art of conversation that's delightful to partake with you yeah it is lovely so I yeah. wish you a lovely July very rainy day out there today it's very gloomy but I have to go out and do some errands so it's a perfect day for running around in town good good well see you around my Great. friend yeah bye 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 in this episode. At the very end, I spoke about only having blogged twice this year, which is what I've done so far in 2022. But there's a lot of blog posts there. There's, I don't know, six, seven hundred blog posts. And there's a lot of good stuff. So if you feel like having a read, check out the blog at tankisbeyond.com.